The Fujicast is an independent loading zone production. The Fujicast. 24 hours, let alone a week, or two weeks, is a long time in news circles these days. So before we start Monday's long show, episode 62, please bear in mind this show was recorded almost two weeks ago in some effort to positively stockpile some experiences rather than nab toilet rolls and tin beans off a shelf ahead of somebody who really needs them. So it was recorded at a time that clearly the virus was a worry, but it hadn't closed shops, pubs, restaurants, blah, 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 and wedding venues. Just bear that in mind. Uh, We're also what uh, might seem implausibly jolly during parts of it, like club indulgence, but then again, it's nice to hear a bit of normality, isn't it? Uh, So welcome to the main Monday show of the Fujicast, which these days, and for a limited time only, while the the V word has us all locked indoors, is accompanied by a daily show as well. Welcome aboard those who don't shoot Fuji. You're very welcome here. And um, you'll find as you listen on that, yeah, we talk about Fuji film stuff, but also we talk about other stuff that doesn't necessarily have a brand badge. And of course, you've just become part of a friendly club. There's Kev's Book of the Week, and at the end of the show, we'll have a, another one of your photo disasters. Uh, you're very welcome to send in your questions. In fact, not just welcome, but it's absolutely now imperative, uh, because it's the only way we're going to keep this show just up and running and doing what it does day after day after day during this period. So um, whatever you have, any stories, any thoughts, any ideas, any questions, please send them in. Click at fujicast.co.uk. Uh, Of course, after today's show, some of the subjects get picked up on our private Facebook group, and uh, we'd like to see you in there. Uh, Today we'll hear from photographer Mick Yates as our special, special guest. Uh, So yes, bear in mind the recording time, when folk didn't cross the street in case of transmission, and uh, we hope you enjoy the show. Right, first question time. Kev, have you got one? Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Go on then. Uh, okay, so this is from Gordon Harding, and he says, Hi, Kevin and Neil, love the show, yada, yada, yada. And he goes on to say, or even, yabba dabba doo da, if you're a Flintstones fan. Oh, my God. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I am a Flintstones fan. I quite like Flintstones. I love the Flintstones. Yeah. Uh, Never thought the movies were very good, though. I like the cartoons. Oh, I thought the movie was brilliant. The first was I don't know if there was a second one, but the first, the one I saw... I thought was amazing. Yeah. Very, very, very. A lot of adult humour mixed in there. Really? Oh, yeah. Okay. Very well, funny. Yeah. Um, I was more of a cartoon man. But yeah, the cartoons were great as well. Mm. Yeah. Good old Barney Rubble. Uh, anyway, from the off, I'm not a professional. Um, th- this is Gordon, not me speaking, by the way, because um, I am a professional. Uh, <laughs> but I do. <laughs> At the moment. <laughs> but I do work on a project style basis where yeah. I choose a subject and spend six to nine months on, my, on only my subject. Oh, well, that's mm. nice. I'm currently working with my local police force in Suffolk to work out a project, uh, sorry, to work on a project called Friday. In the project, I'm covering attitudes to alcohol mainly, it seems. Yeah. This of all my projects has really produced some strong documentary shots. Any thoughts on how I should take this project forward in terms of exhibitions or Facebook and wow. so on? Mm. What, what, a, what an mm. opportunity to have to be able to just concentrate and send it six to nine months at a time. And Yeah, and, and to get in with the police yeah. force and stuff. Yeah. Um, it does make me wonder what your day job is, Gordon. Bet he's a spy. <laughs> what do you say? Spy. Spies can what get is, in anything, can't they? Can they? Yeah. Well, I'm sure that if you I said, look, I've got a great project to a police force, or uh, may- maybe now is not, not the fi- finest time for those in the paramedic industry or, or whatever, <laughs> but, but you know, if, if, if some people might say, yeah, that, you know what, well, that sounds a really interesting project. Mm, no, Why not? Why not? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Can we have the photos? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, Gordon the spy, I would say <laughs> that. Um, <laughs> how do you take it forward well first of all i mean there's a there's a bit of a dilemma here isn't it because it's presumably when he calls it it's called friday and it mm. mostly covers alcohol presumably he's out late at night and that's the, what it sounds the like good folk me, yeah. of suffolk yeah um what's what towns are in suffolk suffolk is like S- southwold uh great, quite great yarmouth town. is that suffolk or norfolk great yarmouth that's norfolk isn't it i think great i think my my uh, auntie lives in yarmouth she can never say yarmouth she comes from Hertfordshire originally without putting that great Yarmouth on it. So I think Great Yarmouth's in in Norfolk. Anyway, so Friday night seems to be the place to be in uh, Suffolk if if you're into fighting and alcohol. Well, that's not necessarily what he's saying there. (laughs) 
Well, <laughs> there's an inference. There's an inference, yeah. yeah. So, um, <laughs> anyway, but the point is, uh, there's a couple of issues I would suggest. I mean, I've never done anything like this, so I mm. don't know. But I, there are a couple of issues in that if this was a public exhibition, for example, yeah. I can't imagine that the people that the police are uh, dealing with on that Friday night who might be in those pictures yeah. would be overly comfortable with those pictures but being ha- published. Ha- yeah, but hang on a minute. Whenever you see these uh, uh, police programs that, mm-hmm. that concentrate on things that happen at the weekends i can't imagine any of those people give you permission to to well, show those those the film footage of of them being arrested and then in the no but it's, in the cop shop um, perhaps those people have their their privileges removed however if you look at those films there's a mm. lot of blurred out faces in All the right. backgrounds so it's the it's the people that are with them or whatever or you know all the. I wonder how you uh, uh, how would you go around sort of during an incident afterwards immediately afterwards saying, got some? Would you you know? Yeah, but that's what I'm saying. Like that's, Fifteen people around. That's you know, a. That's, you can blur your face out. I don't know the answer. I don't know the legalities of yeah. it. I mean, if the thing is, if it was something, if you just took the picture. Um, as you, because you're a bystander, mm. then that that would presumably come under citizen journalism and would be absolutely fine for exhibitions and publications and everything. All right. However, because you're uh, working with the local police force, then I don't know whether those rules and boundaries are a bit more blurred. Um, I wonder if it. I wonder if it depends upon if money is passing hands. Yeah, I'm guessing there's not. And if there's no money. No, no, is it still citizen? Yeah, journalism? perhaps, but but you know, it's it's that that grey line is currently working with our local police force. So I, d- I really don't know. However, yeah. let's just assume. Okay, let's take out the um, Suffolk and the drinking and the police and everything. Let's yeah. just assume that the project was um, the people that cross the Millennium Bridge in London. All right? right. Okay. Let's just assume, and he spent nine months doing that, um, which is absolutely fine. Mm. How would he get that forward? How would he um, take the project forward in terms of exhibitions, Facebook, etc.? What would you do first? Well, obviously, there's there's a local angle to this Suffolk thing, isn't there? So is it, it's going to be more interesting for... We're not in Suffolk. I'm not in, we're on, on the London Bridge, Bridge now. Okay. We're on so the Millennium Bridge in London. Come all right. On, keep, Let, it well, okay, keep, think, keep it there. I'm thinking locally then. So the, um, an exhibition in that local area is going to be... You've, you've well, Mind you, you've chosen uh, a, a sort of a, a tourist uh, destination, that bridge there. Um, but okay, so I'd, I'd be thinking of a local exhibition first. I'm kind of thinking of Suffolk still because it is, uh, it's got more relevance. Mm-hmm. Um, so you've got to think of relevance, I think. Yeah, I mean, I would be thinking, um, yeah, like you say, local, some kind of local um, exhibition, which is very easy to do. Mm. We we have uh, in Malmesbury the town hall. You can rent the um, the town hall, the the kind of opening of the town hall. Um, oh, you can okay. rent the wall space and hang things up there. Um, you could do obviously Facebook and social media and everything, but you would you'd benefit from having a beautiful website behind yeah, it. You, would, yeah. you could do um, a blurb book that you could sell. Uh, you know, do that on a on a print run basis. Oh, self publishing. Self publishing. We talked about that earlier uh, last year, didn't we? Yeah. Like, late, late last year. All that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, you, you know, I think ultimately, if the subject is interesting enough, mm. somebody will be very happy to to exhibit it for you. Um, it could even be just a local pub, you know, pictures on the wall, not necessarily for sale or anything, but just as a as a conversational piece. Turn it into a series of films, put it on YouTube. Yeah, yeah, some, exactly. Some slideshows. Talk about the images, yeah. YouTube, all that yeah. kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, however, I think you know the the police thing is a uh, is that that's you'd have to get that yeah sorted out, and, and you'd have to do that. Um, double O Gordon. In between your <laughs> in between your day job and whatever else you do, <laughs> Mike from what I see, photography is written in questions for you both in relation to shooting weddings. From a from a wedding shoot, how often do you crop images to get what you want? And if you do, on average, by how much? Well, let's there's a there's a series of questions here, so let's take each one. So um, I, I do crop. Yep, I crop awkward things out. Um, I hate far exit signs. It appears to me that wedding venues um, need to think about the photography whilst also thinking about what people will be doing when they're running towards an exit, obviously. Mm. Um, so I, I tend to crop those out if I can. If I can't, then pff, there's nothing you can do about it. But um, what else? Uh, sometimes you see the odd flailing elbow at the side on a dance shot, which I find a distraction mm. in the final image, so I'll crop that out. Mm. That that that's why I would crop. What about you? Yeah, it's pretty similar. I'll crop. I'll crop wherever I need to to crop. What I won't do is 
edit things yeah. out. Uh, so if that arm is in the picture or the fire escape picture, fire exit sign is in the picture and I can't crop it out yeah. just naturally, then I'm not going to edit it out. Um, there's a slight difference there. But there's a lot of purists, aren't there, say should should you know, should shouldn't crop at all. But I mean, you look at some of the the great. Um, yeah, Elliot Erwitt. If you look at some of the contact sheets of Elliot Erwitt, there's an enormous amount of cropping going in. Oh, yeah, absolutely. There's nothing wrong with cropping, I don't think, no. personally. Um, I mean, I, I have to straighten pretty much every one of my pictures. <laughs> you know, and that, that oh, yeah, involves, that's the other thing I do. That yeah, involves yeah, some yeah, kind yeah, of cropping yeah, yeah, because yeah, yeah. It, it bends the sides. Yes. Um, yeah. yeah, so, I, uh, yeah, I mean, I, 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 I'm just trying to think back to that the last edit I did, and I, th- I think I can – it was a big wedding, four days. It was that thing in, in Switzerland. So the clients have got like six, 700 pictures yeah. over those four days. Um, and I can remember physically on two occasions, you know, using the crop tool to to really kind of crop in quite tight. Mm. Other than that, it was mostly straightening things up. And I was crop stuff. horizons. Oh, I can't. I, I go bonkers if I see a, see a um, you know a river or a sea or something where the, the horizons are wrong. Uh, yeah, I'm the same with, <laughs> yeah. I, and I'm the same yeah. with walls, yes. vertical walls. Yes. Um, yes. Although sometimes you cannot avoid it. You know, mm. if you're down on your knees, getting a low angle of, of you know a veil going on or something. Uh, you know, especially if you're shooting vertically, yeah. you're gonna. You sometimes you can't avoid it. Right. Um, yeah. So, what was the second part? Uh, of that second question? one. How many how many images would you take at a ten hour wedding coverage? I I, I don't. Th- oh, there's no average at all, really. Um, you take as many as you need, which I know is probably not the answer that you want, but. I remember that question that you get asked all the time by all wedding guests. How many have you taken today then? Oh, four and a half gallons. <laughs> oh, all right then. <laughs> We've talked about that before, but I don't know. I'd, I wouldn't know an image count uh, from one wedding to the next. I would say, I mean, my weddings typically are around about eight to nine hours rather than ten hours. Right. But I would say, and for that I would expect to give them 400 pictures. Mm-hmm. And I, the final count. The final count would be yeah. four hundred pictures, and I would say that we all overshoot, don't we? So I'm, I'm saying that again. I don't know for sure, but I, I'm guessing somewhere between eighteen hundred, twenty three hundred clicks. Okay. Um. So what's that? One in every four. Yeah. Pictures. Something like that. Well, that kind of uh, links into Mike's next question. How many images would you present to the client? Well, we've, we've answered that. Mm. Uh, and then do they get to select a certain number from those? No, what, they, what they're given is what, they, what yep. they have. And that's because you take out any of the rubbish. Mm-hmm. And sometimes it's very difficult when clients come back to you and say, well, have you got more of X? You think, no, I don't. There's, there's not some sort of gem collection that I'm keeping. That, you, know, that, you know, that's, that's a question you, uh, you, you will get, Mike. Interestingly, I had a email from a, a client from last year, um, just this week, in fact, and he said, um, and they were very, very happy with their wedding pictures. And he said that his mother had just passed away. Oh. Um, and were there any other images? And uh, I had to say, you know, um, there isn't. And, and the reason there isn't is because if any of the pictures were good if they were good enough you would have had them in the first case yeah yeah and and you know if they were you know if it was just the back of her head or you know whatever then it's pointless giving her giving them those kinds of pictures so difficult conversation it is a difficult i mean he fully respected that absolutely um but it's uh you know you sometimes occasionally you do get get Mm -hmm. asked that but yeah absolutely you you know you're not going to hold pictures back that are good enough to give to them he says, I'm seeing, there's only another couple of questions. I'm seeing some photogs in Australia saying 1,500 to 2,000 images delivered. That, w- that, w- that would seem to me excessive. Well, in some people's language, it isn't, because you're absolutely right, Mike. There are people that deliver that many images. I can't believe that they'd be quality controlled and, and edited to, um, to the sort of standard that yeah. I, I like to think that I'm, I'm providing. I think 2,000 per wedding would it's be... It's not excessive, it's oh. lazy. Right, it's lazy. Yeah, it's lazy to give people that many pictures. Absolutely, you're going to be in trouble now. Oh, well, tough. It is lazy. <laughs> you know, you can't. You, if you if you're giving them that many pictures, mm. you're taking way, 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 way more than that. You're doing an initial edit. You're not considering um, crops or colours or anything like that. And you're, you know, I would imagine a vast majority of those people. And of course, there may be different people who are not in that this case, but. Mm. The vast majority of those people are undercharging, shooting too many picture, too many weddings, mm. using using the commodity of numbers on their marketing. And fifteen, if you're if you're giving clients fifteen hundred pictures out of a ten eight hour ten hour wedding, then I think that it's you may have fifteen hundred brilliant pictures. I I'd be I'd love to have fifteen hundred pictures that I was happy to give to my clients at every wedding. 
Um, but I don't. And I, I feel that most people wouldn't either. And if they don't think they're good enough, then they shouldn't be giving it to them. It's lazy. <laughs> right. OK. Don't sit on the fence at all, Kev, will you? Um, <laughs> and, and the final one, I think I know the answer to this one. Uh, Kev, are you doing any workshops in Australia? If so, please include Brisbane in your schedule. Thank mm. you. I did I did uh, plan one once, yeah, um, but I got scuppered by the visa again. Oh, no. Yeah, I looked into it. I said, Dear Australia House, I'm thinking about doing a workshop. Yeah. Uh, you need to jump through this massive hoop here. You need to pay for this visa here. You need... Uh, no, it's okay. Don't worry. Thanks. I thought that education was uh, was different. I thought that was uh, exempt from some of those visa regulations. Uh, it is in some you're not, circumstances. You're not going over there to steal work from somebody. No, for example, in America, um, you you can do it. You can go for uh, f- to educate. Mm. You can do it. Um, you have to you know you have to be honest about what you're doing there. But you can't go and photograph a wedding. Do, do you have to get a visa, some sort of visa beforehand for that? Uh, no, as no. far as I'm aware. So I had an email from uh, the U.S what do you call it embassy agency embassy people um, that, that I've kept and it basically says that if you're doing education your standards um, MIB it? I think they're called what's the men uh, in black MIB yeah <laughs> Um, and the people in charge. Double O Gordon probably knows them. <laughs> um, the uh, what's the what's the uh, what's that thing we've got where you can go for thirty days to America without any? Uh, you you uh, fill, it, fill it in on a paint. Esther, yeah, Esther. yeah, Esther, Esther. I like Esther. Yeah, Esther, she's all right, isn't she? Esther, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I've had some good times with Esther. Um, never really lasted. Never really lasted very long. Though. Well, that's that Mirtha Tidfill thing all over again. <laughs> um, <laughs> one time I lost her. You know, I lost her. I got off the plane, and by the time I got to the uh, MIB, I'd lost Esther. I was like, "Oh, I'm in a lot of trouble." He's in a lot of medication at the moment, is Kev? Is a, if you're wondering where his brain is. But it was okay though. They just gave me another Esther. <laughs> oh yeah. Who'd have thought there was that many Esters in the world? Um, Are you feeling okay, Kev? <laughs> <laughs> sure. Uh, what was the question anyway? Um, oh, about Australia. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I did look into Australia, and they were a little bit less yes. um, welcoming. Um, but I would love it. You know, I'd love to go. Oh, actually, no, I wouldn't like to go to Australia. They got spiders, haven't they? Oh, come on, Kev. No, you're not gonna. Yeah, yeah. Now this spider and snake thing's an interesting thing about Australia because before, prior to me going there, I thought the country was going to be heaving with creepy crawlies. <laughs> And uh, and although it is true that you're never more than a couple of feet away from a snake, apparently in most most parts of, um, but then that's like rats in this country, isn't it? Mm. Um, the the reality is that these um, these things just aren't waiting, uh, you know, s- sitting on a path for Kev to pass. So, Here comes Kev. Get ready, guys. Let's jump him. Um, in fact, the the snake death rate there. Um, I remember asking the um, a guy who was holding. It was, it, was, it was at one of these wildlife um, centres that look after animals and, and do good things for Australia. And he had this taipan in his, in his hand and on one of those snake rods, dangerously close to me. And I said, um, how many people die from, from snake bites? And he said, um, in this country, he said, uh, 1.8. And I said, 1.8? 1. 1,800? 8. Uh, he said, because that, that would have, you know, I, I'd have believed that. He said, no, no, 1.8. I said, what, 180? No, 1.8. Don't know where they get the point eight from, but let's let's round it up to two. Two people a year in Australia die from snake bites. That can't be right. And they have the nine most venomous snakes in the world. I don't believe that. That's He's true. lying to you because he had a taipan in his hand. <laughs> type it into Google now. Go and type oh, in how type many in. people die in Australia from snake okay. bites. All right. How many people in Australia die from snake bites? Okay, so. Uh, as many as 300 people are bitten by snakes in Australia each year, but there are few associated deaths. 18 people have died since 2011. So actually, if you do the averages, that's about right then, isn't it? I can't believe that. There we go. That's crazy. That um, uh, uh, Compare that to um, Africa and India, yeah. who have tens of thousands of deaths per year from, from snake bites. I remember going doing that thing in the Gambia, um, doing that film in the Gambia, and... Uh, uh, a friend of mine um, who was working as co-producer on this thing, um, Andy, is, lives in the Gambia, and, and he he has a, Uncle Mo lives right out in the in the you know Uncle Mo don't you? Uh, right, <laughs> right out in the sticks <laughs> near the coast. I was being flippant. Um, everybody knows stay, Unc- Uncle stay, Mo. Uncle Mo just sounds like somebody you should know, doesn't it? I stay quiet in case it was meant to be somebody I did know. No, no, I didn't know. <laughs> and Uncle Mo uh, one day said, "Well, let, let me take you down to the coast and, and show you some of the nice sights." I thought I'd be lovely, and he walked us right through a field with grass about that tall. And I said, as we were going along, I said, Un- "Uncle Mo, uh, just just a thought. What about the snakes here?" 
He said, oh, there'll be lots, but they'll, you know, just keep stamping and they'll stay away from you. Mm. <laughs> so, I never went out with Uncle Mo after that again. See, I'm, I, I feel safer in Ireland. There's no snakes in Ireland. <laughs> St. Yeah. Patrick sorted all I know. That's note. true. Right, okay, your question. Right, I have a that question. A slight curveball there, wasn't it? I have a question from uh, Adam, yeah. and his Instagram is uh, at checkmybadself. What? C-H-E-C-K my, M-Y, B-A-D-S-E-L-F. Check my bad self. Right. He says, hi, guys, uh, and a belated St. David's Day to you. Thank mm. you. Uh, a non-professional photographer here, Fuji user, and a ginormous fan of the podcast. Right. Ginormous, I love that word. Ginormous. <laughs> ginormous. You know when you're doing Google page speed tests? Join a wall. Which all professional photographers should be doing, right. by the way. It often uses the word ginormous. Does it? Avoid, it, it uses ginormous and enormous. Ano- an, avoid ginormous page requests. What's better, uh, bigger, enormous or ginormous? Enormous, I think, is, is, is bad. Yeah. Enormous trumps gi- ginormous. Best not to have anything enormous or ginormous on your website right. yeah definitely <laughs> right. apart from visitors uh, and then yeah quite and then he goes on to say short and sweet question from me i've been getting better on photography over the years should i delete my older photographs from instagram <gasps> no have a look then pop, pop his instagram up for us adam yeah mm-hmm. because i cannot see the screen neil has to make the executive decision on whether your old pictures are bad well i'm um oh some- he's hovering there's some that terrific hesitation. No, there. there's some terrific. Uh, the, uh, there's some terrific um, street scenes on here. Lot oh, of, don't don't get rid of the terrific seem, stuff, Adam. You seem to be hanging out outside Curzon Soho and some of these you know, Moulin Rouge. There we go, live uh, peep show. <laughs> hmm. <laughs> Let's go right to the end. Right, keep uh, going, keep moving going, on, keep going, moving keep going. on. Uh, no, do you know what? I'm going all, all the way down to the bottom here. I would not delete any of these. There you go. No, the results are in. And we've said don't delete. I mean, the style changes. I'll give you that. The style changes a lot, but I I think it shows. Um, I think I like to look at people's old Instagram feeds. Right, uh, if, if there's somebody I particularly follow, I do go right to the bottom of the feed and, and see see the progression of work. I I personally find that uh, quite an interesting thing. Hmm. What, about, what about you? Yeah, yeah. Uh, sometimes, occasionally. Yeah, well, I've never you- go to the bottom of my own one though. Ooh. Have you ever deleted anything from the bottom of your feed? <laughs> no, no, not that I can think okay. of. Um, okay. I can't even think when I started my Instagram. All right. A friend of the show, James Souls, before we go to this week's interview. Hi, me again. I'm trying to properly get my head around noise reduction and what looks best at what settings. Kev, you mentioned you have presets for noise reduction based on ISO level. Um, are you able to share those settings? Oh, ooh, is that... Uh, yeah, I can. Um, so I use smart collections in Lightroom to categorize images by ISO, mm-hmm. ISO, ISO, however you want to call it. I once had to go into a lot of trouble in America by saying ISO. Did you? Yeah. So right. A guy who really he stood up in the middle of a talk I was giving. Well, because you said ISO. Yeah, and he was very, very upset. <laughs> and I'm and not he wanted even joking. you to say ISO. I'm not even joking. Really? Yeah. What did you say? Uh, I just... I don't know. I just kind of said, "Oh, I'm, I'm dreadfully sorry," and then ca- carried on calling it ISO. Right. Um, but yeah, he was really angry. <laughs> did you carry on calling it ISO? Yeah, of course right. I did. I'm going to let something like that put me off my stride. Yeah. Um, and you sit down. Don't be rude. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so I, I use smart collections to categorise the images by ISO yeah. in Lightroom, <laughs> and essentially I do anything that's twelve thousand eight hundred plus. Right. I use a noise reduction um, of fifty. Uh, 6,400 to 12,800 I use 40 3,200 to 6,400 I use 30 1,200 to 3,400 I use 20 and then anything, anything less I don't use anything right okay I hope that's answered your question thank you very much James right here comes this week's uh, guest. Mick Yates is a documentary photography storyteller. Having travelled and worked all over the world, not fueled necessarily in terms of finances by photography, he began to, to employ the use of his camera to make stories about the incredible places he's lived in or spent time working and travelling in. Now, we've been talking of late about personal projects and how important it can be to find a story to tell. Uh, never more so than now, perhaps. Some of these projects can be family-related, and during these times of coronavirus, where, where travel is not always possible or even permitted, uh, they may be simply life stories on a day-to-day canvas. Others may be thematically maybe deeper in terms of history or narrative, and, and I think this is one. 
I was made aware of Mick's work by one particular project which has formed the basis of his MA, a study of Cambodia, and in particular the history of the Cambodian genocide in the mid to late 70s. But this isn't work of a gratuitous nature. It's a study of nature, and using infrared photography mixed with text over the pictures to tell a, tell a story of what will always be one of the hardest moments in the history of that country and its people, along with video interviews and other forms of narrative. And Mick is now a photography teacher running workshops that explore working on the street. His website shows a plethora of content and is worth checking out. So let me introduce you to Mick Yates. I've been a photographer all of my life, although most of that time it's been uh, a passion and a hobby. Who I am in the other life is a combination of business person um, and um, teacher. So I've been in business pretty much since I left university. Mm. Um, was lucky enough to travel all over the world working with some big companies, which also allowed me to take photographs. But in the last, I don't know, five, ten years, I've been taking my photography more seriously. So probably for the first time, I might describe myself as I'm a photographer when somebody asks me. Now, your father was quite the photographer. I mean, you don't have to go far back in there. I was th one of the first places I visit when I go to somebody's uh, website is the blog. But I didn't have to go far back to actually read uh, a piece about his photography. He was quite the photographer, wasn't he? Yeah, he passed, he passed away, um, sadly, um, 18 months ago. He was almost almost 92. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, in fact, he was quite fit until the last six months of his life, and he was actually scanning his negatives. Yeah. He's got all his negatives, all of his slides, and he started taking photographs, I guess, when he was a teenager. So I've got a whole bunch of stuff of his from um, his time in Egypt at uh, the tail end of World War II. He couldn't afford brilliant equipment, but I think he had quite a good eye. So one of my projects at the moment is to go back through his archives and, if you like, bring it out, show it in some way to the public, because I think it, it's quite an interesting story that he's got. And what's that like going back through um, a parent's um, portfolio as, as as it were I would imagine it must be a, a, an, an enthralling process but also also maybe a melancholic one uh, it's both and I think you also take it quite seriously I find myself taking my dad's pictures more seriously <laughs> than mine um <laughs> Because I sort of want to do justice to it. Well, I'm going to come back to your um, your life living out of a suitcase in in in, mm. in some respects in a moment. But um, well, I, I think actually while we're talking about age, I mean, photography on the whole is one of those age levelers. With, with your immense experience in business and travel, I would imagine you see that as even greater worth for those wanting to turn a dime in this business who who may be thinking, "Have I left this too late?" Oh, I, yeah. I mean, let me start with me. I, I'm not particularly looking for a career in photography to make a huge amount of money. So let me put that to one side for a minute. But the one thing I've learned in the last few years, especially doing this MA, is you're right, it's a total leveler. Anybody can do it, but it's really hard because you've got to come up with something that's a little different, something distinct. You've only got to look to, at Instagram to see what isn't distinct and what isn't different. And I think having an exploration of what you're trying to say, whether you happen to be 18 years old or, as I am, almost 70 years old, I think that's the key to the whole thing. Then you can translate that into some photography, some images, something that makes some kind of sense to people and something that might interest others. In any photograph, there are three things, aren't there? There's a subject, there's a photographer, and there's an audience. Mm. Anybody can find a subject. The photographer, I think, has to have a point of view. And then the audience, well, you have to decide what you're shooting for, really. And I think that's probably the biggest issue when you're, when you're trying to, to build a, a career in anything. Who's your audience? It's a really big issue in photography these days. Well, I want to talk about your photographic projects. Um, mm. But before we do that, um, your life, as I mooted a moment ago, living out of a suitcase, re uh, reads, frankly, Mick, like a, a captain's flight airlock. I mean, I... Over three decades in global, global corporations, 22 years at P&G, I think, wasn't it? And you've lived on three continents, six children born in five countries, uh, and somehow you, you found uh, time to, to build you know, an impressive photographic portfolio and, 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 and carry that through. Uh, how did the two work in tandem? Or, or, or of late, I think it's a little bit more obvious that the photography's taken, taken more of a role of late, though, hasn't it? Yeah, I think... Um it honestly went up and down. I mean, when I was a kid, I was absolutely fascinated by what was happening in photography. Uh, the Sunday Times magazine, Don McCullum, David Bailey, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. So it was natural for me that as I started to get a little bit of money, we would travel. 
so I went to China and India and Russia in the 70s um, as a tourist. And then when I started doing this professionally, it also became obvious to take a camera with me. I, I wanted to explore. I wanted to see what was there. And it wasn't from the point of view of how different everything is, but actually I learned that we're all more the same than we are different. And I try to put that into my photography. Bringing it completely up to date, um, we were, lived in Asia for a long time, and my wife, got in, my wife and I got involved in building schools in Cambodia. It was her idea. Um, I sort of became the figurehead for it, and I started taking photographs of it, which was well, now 20 years ago. Mm. Um, so when I started doing the MA, one of the attractions of the MA was not just the theory, but also that I had to deliver a project. Mm. So I went back to the people that we knew, um, in fact, kept in touch with and seen them many times since, um, that were helping with this project, that were Cambodians, that had survived the genocide in the 1970s. The Khmer Rouge, yeah. Yeah. So although I'd not really documented this terribly well, other than the schools um, in the early days, I felt I wanted to go back and tell their story. Yeah. And that was what my recent photography has been all about. Um, how do I tell somebody's story, something that happened 40 years ago, something terrible that actually they came out of in a good way? They you know, dedicated their lives to education. So how do you deal with genocide? How do you deal with aftermath? Um, but how do you deal with people's stories and not just some kind of what's called dark tourism when you're sort of peering at mm. stuff, an imperial glaze, you know? Oh, I'm not. I'm glad I'm not part of this kind of thing. No, it's their story, and and I'm just happen to be the best of to to tell it. Well, let's talk about that project. I, I am mm. I'm of an age where I remember news stories. My parents talking about the Khmer Rouge, responsible for uh, somewhere in the region of two million deaths in in Cambodia, um, in a, a cleansing, la la largely the, the result of political mistakes in the country and the American carpet bombing during the Vietnam War of, of a country that should never have been pulled into this. And that's probably a clumsy approach to being historically succinct, but that's the way I, I see it. Your, I think that's pretty accurate, Neil, actually. Yeah, your, that's pretty much what happened. Your photo project, Unfinished Stories, is intensely thought-provoking before we even talk about the artistry. What led you to it? What, why, why that particular story? And because you were in that part of the world, I know, but why that particular story? Um, the original genesis of it was in 1994, um, which is the first time Ingrid and I went to Cambodia. And we took our four kids, the youngest of which was 12 months old. And we went to uh, Angkor Wat, which is, of course, the famous tourist centre now. There were no tourists there, and what we didn't realise was that the Khmer Rouge were actually kidnapping tourists and holding them to ransom, and if they didn't get the ransom, they were killing them. Because although the genocide stopped in 1979, uh, the country was actually basically in a state of civil war until 1999. So, so we inadvertently stepped into the middle of it, and um, we heard a noise while we were at Angkor Wat, which... Um, the lady that was showing us around said it was thunder, but it was a totally blue sky. And it turned out it was the Royal Cambodian Army and the Khmer Rouge shelling the bejesus out of each other about 20 kilometres away. Wow. So we got back home. and At the time, we lived in uh, Japan. And we went, ah, oh, that's interesting. And Ingrid said, let's do something about that. And when the country started to reconcile after the death of Pol Pot, that's when we got involved, 1999. But then when I was looking at doing more serious photography... I realized I hadn't told the stories properly of the people that we thought we knew. And I went back to do that. And um, they were willing, very willing. And I'd set, I'd, I, I did video interviews. I did um, took notes. And in fact, they started telling stories to their families that their families hadn't heard before. So I felt very privileged to be doing this. And quite a moving experience for those in the it, videos I saw. It, yeah, it absolutely was. And when I started this, I was a bit naive. I thought, well, I can get some stories and... I can do some portraits and I can do a bit of, you know, environmental stuff. And I thought that was pretty trite. And the more I dug into it, I realized that it was a hidden genocide because people know a little bit about it. And I didn't want to just do portraits and skulls and, you know, graveyards. I, I wanted to do something a bit different. And it became clear to me that the landscape, these two million people that you referenced, were they're not memorialized anywhere. They're, they're in hidden killing fields. There are about 20,000 grave sites in Cambodia, not just the killing fields that everybody knows. Mm. And so the landscape had got the story. And I wanted to therefore connect the story to the landscape in a way that was paradoxical. 
Cambodia is a beautiful country, but it's got all these terrible dark secrets. And that's really what led me to the to the creative solution, if you like. So the creative solution you're talking about, I think, is the infrared photographic technique, because it's not at all what, what you're expecting when you perhaps look at a, a portfolio about this story. No, it's not. It's absolutely not. And um, you also then expect to see beautiful landscapes with some horrible phrase uh, from a from a real life story sort of involved with it it's not a caption it's part of the image and i i got the inspiration from a lady called judy glickman lauder leonard lauder's wife who actually um she's a photographer and she did a wonderful book uh, on the danish exception to the holocaust where the, the danes did a particularly good job of hiding the jewish population mm. and she used a combination of black and white negatives and infrared and and she made an aesthetic choice based on what she felt was appropriate. And I thought, yeah, that's that's pretty clever. So I used black and white. I did negatives as well, and then I used the infrareds. I don't like the sort of the faux infrared where you've got all these garish colors and crazy stuff going on. But the thing about infrared is because, certainly the one I was using, the camera I was using, um, it chlorophyll is transparent to infrared. So So leaves show white greenery shows white. And historically, Cambodia was a very forested country, and it was very forested at the time of the genocide. These days, sadly, a lot of it's gone for commercial reasons. But I thought the idea of the forest that you could see through with the infrared showing it as white, I thought that was quite appropriate to yeah. the story that we were we were trying to communicate. And what was the feedback like from, from those on the ground there? They've, they've seen this approach, and perhaps they weren't expecting it either, of course. No, they weren't. They weren't expecting to write their stories down. They weren't expecting to be videoed. No. Um, and in fact, um, they got quite emotional. Surat, my, my best friend, got quite emotional doing yeah. I checked in with them all the time, actually. And I showed them where I was on the work. Obviously, I was doing the MA at the time, and I was showing my tutors. So, yeah, I got a lot of feedback from uh, the people underground in Cambodia, my friends, and including Cambodian photographers that I've, I've got to know, like Mac Ramissa. Photographers in Cambodia have touched a little bit on the genocide but it isn't a well it's not a well covered subject by local photographers and they thought wow this is interesting and different it wasn't necessarily to their liking and then when i included text people were like hang on you've got a photograph with text on it isn't that supposed to be a caption how does that work so that was different again We've talked about projects on the show before, and Unfinished Stories is obviously a project, and the value of personal projects, both motivational and in terms of, of the artistic output. What, what, piques, what piques your interest, Mick, when it comes to project work? Because they're really very varied. I mean, we go from Unfinished Stories to Stephen Dingo, a story about a man and his dog. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That, although that was a bit of a commission as well. Um, I, I like to tell stories full stop. I'm a reasonably practiced teacher and I took a something of a teaching approach to my my business world actually um, I used to think of myself as a teacher for the, the people we had in the organization and I found over the years that the best way to teach is to tell a story um, which as you well know in podcasts is pretty easy verbally you tell a story you've got a beginning you've got a middle you've got an end a punchline a funny story whatever serious point to make but I think in photography it gets missed a lot I mean, you can see that when, when people start with street photography for the first time. They're taking pictures on the street. They're, they're standing across the street with a zoom lens or something. Yes. But they're not really trying to figure out what's happening. They're not really trying to understand the interaction between the people in the image and the environment. So to me, that's always been the interesting point. And what kind of street photographer are you then? I happen to think we're all the same uh, rather than different in so many ways across the world. And I've also learned that respect is a really important part of um, actually what being human is all about. So I refuse to take pictures of homeless people in streets just because I can get a nice, sharp picture of a beard, which sadly you see too many times on Facebook and Instagram. So I don't particularly do covert photography. I know there's a lot of great covert photographers in history, Walker Evans on the subway and so on. I also don't um, try to take pictures with a zoom lens across the street. I will take pictures that maybe the subject doesn't know I'm taking. But if somebody looks at me when I'm taking the picture, I'll smile and I'll say, can I take your picture? So I actually do do uh, the odd workshop on, on street portraits because I think that, to me, is, is more where my heart is. But you also said it's a psychological challenge for you. 
Yeah, because the funny thing is, and you might not realize it from this podcast, I'm actually quite shy. I've had that as an issue for a long time. Okay. I've always had a bit of a... No, it doesn't come across. And and, and, no, cert- and no, certainly not in your photographic work. That that must be said. Yeah, no, I'm pretty introspective. Not, I'm not an extrovert in any way. For me, being on the street, taking pictures of people is, is not something I can do without thinking. I completely admire people like Dougie Wallace and Martin Parr and frankly, not so much Bruce Gilden, but I certainly admire the, the other guys because they've got, they seem to have no fear. They can go and do this. Mm. To me, it's quite a mental exercise, quite a psychological challenge. Future travels then. Is, is there a continent that fits the remit for the next photographic project and story? Somewhere, <laughs> somewhere where you haven't been, where you think, you yeah, know well, it's about time I did that. It's not a continent, but uh, amazingly, one place we have never been to is Iceland. And um, although we don't particularly like the cold, <laughs> um, I'd love to, to spend some time there, a um, bit of a road trip. I also, frankly, want to spend some more time in the UK. I was in Glastonbury uh, last week with a relative showing them around. It happens to be quite local to us. And although I'm not big on magic, there is something about Glastonbury and ley yeah. lines and... Um, how well, you, the landscape has been used over the years uh, since uh, pre-Roman times. And you followed that line, didn't you, that goes yeah. fr- from the, yeah. the, the right at the tip of Cornwall up, up into East Anglia, doesn't it? And that, that's part of that whole whole line, Glastonbury, isn't it? There is a thing called St Michael's Line, which starts in um, St Michael's Mount in Cornwall, goes all the way across to Norfolk. It's quite controversial. Uh, the guy that first posited these ley lines didn't really look at the magic side of it, so it's got a little bit subverted from his original intent. So again, I'm not interested so much in the magic, I'm not looking for dragons or serpents, but I am intrigued as to the relationship between people and the landscape, which in this country is incredibly long-standing, several thousand years. And so I, I think maybe for the next couple of years, a little bit of travel, but perhaps a bit more work on home territory. That shows there's an awful lot on our doorstep that we just don't see sometimes. There is indeed, absolutely. So my thanks to uh, to Mick Yates. Um, next week, actually we've got your uh, big interview coming up in a couple of weeks' time, haven't we? Your Parker Fister one. Parker J. Fister, yeah. Very much. Hero of mine. Hero. Yeah. And great guy. next week, Fran May. Um, it will be the the guest on the the show. Right, let's go for books. What book have you brought in? This is Kev's book of the week. Half oh, my book. The only thing we don't have a jingle for. Book of the week. Yeah, we should. Um, um, well, I've drifted. <laughs> What's um, thingy you does our um, Fujicast is an independent production. Alex. Alex. Yeah. So he used to have the re- he used to bring a record in on his radio show every morning from his uh, from his uh, home. Right. And he would call it. Um, Alex's record of the day, or something. No, yeah, but it was from my from my record collection in my attic, or something. I can't remember yeah. whatever it was. It was, th- but it had a it had what a th- thing about what it. A simple feature. Yeah, it yeah. was a very simple feature. I like a lot of Alex's features. Do you remember he he used to make up um, places where people lived, like Bologna. Um, if you if you yeah. if you look at the way Bologna is spelled, it says something very very different. <laughs> I do <laughs> imaginary places. A bit like, do you remember Potty Time? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, a bit like Potty Time. I remember. With, uh, who was uh, P- Potty Time? Michael Benteen. Michael Benteen's a fascinating chap, by the way. Do you remember Michael Benteen from your childhood? Mm, vaguely. Michael Benteen. Was he one of the goons? Was he one, uh, Michael, one of the goons? I don't. Michael Benteen, very, very funny man. And he had I don't this. I think he was a goon. He had the children's show called Potty Time. Yeah, I remember where, that. Where they had all these, these, um, these puppets. <laughs> and he, he wrote all these stories and, and different lands that they would live in. Uh, but Michael Benteen was in World War Two. He, w- he wor- worked in the RAF. Huh. And he was able to apparently tell um, where, whether these pilots would be coming home or not. He had this sixth sense that, that was unnerving. Wow. Yeah, I know. So anyway, back to the book. Book of the week. Uh, so this week I have uh, another welsh orientated yeah. book, Land of My Father, photographs by David Hearn. Um, I don't know why I made a silly noise when I said his name then. David Hearn, hero again oh, of no, uh, all of us. Work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So David is a uh, one of the elder statesmen of the Magnum Foundation. Yes. Um, very, very um, beautiful photographer. Yeah, he was part of the, um, I'm not sure whether he was technically part of the uh, the Brit Pack or whatever they called it, the Rat Pack of mm. uh, photographers back in the 50s. But he was certainly in that circle. Um, a lot of iconic um, supermodel type photos and um, pop stars and stuff in those days, pop mm. stars. Um, however, this book is uh, much more of a documentary approach. 
and it is uh, simple, simple black and white pictures of days gone by. And you know, you know why of these. This, you, you get lost in books like this. This is you? incredible. Yeah. So this is the six bells at, uh, at Abertillery. Um, you say that as if you know it. I do know it. Oh right, <laughs> that's why. Is it still the Six Bells? Yeah, 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 yeah. It's still there. And, um, and you can't it, change a pub's name ever, can it, you? Because that's bad luck. That's true. I'm presuming. So this is this is a lot of men walking because there's no a lot, most of these pictures in here are not there's no annotation annotated. Absolutely, no. it's just where they are. So there's a lot of men walking up the street. Um, they're all well. Um, now these will have all been colliers in yeah. those days. Yes. Um, they're all well presented. There's some young lads. It's all men. Mm. Um, they've all got suits on and ties so, but they're all singing or they're reading from a hymn sheet of some kind so I don't know whether it's a march a funeral or whatever I really don't know um, but it's a very you know it's a very interesting picture uh, top left of that picture you've got a dog looking out of the window at the mall you've got mm. bottom right you've got a man um, waving his arms presumably kind of cheering on these guys Next one next to it is Tenby, and it's a couple like of people, Tenby. very British Tenby. You've just, been on holiday to Tenby. It's just down the road from Nineby in Tenby. Um, <laughs> and it's, uh, it's, it's a beautiful picture. It's very typical British scene. Yeah. Summertime, clearly. Uh, man, woman, sunbathing in jeans and jumpers. Uh, dog asleep <laughs> next to did. them. Yeah. <laughs> beautiful. Pentwin, uh, that's Collier's. A lot of mining pictures in here, Neath. Nice. Mm. Uh, oh, hang on. We've gone to Pontadewi now. <laughs> Pontadewi uh, changes quite a lot, doesn't it? Pontadewi has changed the perspective quite substantially. Uh, it is a... Quite a uh, scene. The annual national tea, wet t-shirt competition. Yeah. The page on number 69 is Newport. Now, this is where I'm from. And that looks very similar to a picture of my mum and dad from the 70s. <laughs> Maybe it is. <laughs> lots of uh, lots of tins of harp lager and cigarettes. Okay. And, uh, you know. <laughs> is that what you grew up surrounded by? <laughs> Bless them. No, I didn't. My pa- I had a lovely childhood. Um, we've got Forge. So- this is amazing. I haven't looked through this book in such a long time, and I, gra- I dragged it off the shelf today. It's a historical um, journey, isn't it? Oh. <laughs> Commons cock. Um it says it is um, some. What did you um, say? Commons, Commons Cock. Commons. Wh- Commons Cock. It's is a that place. a place? Yes. Right. Okay. Um, and there is some. Uh, you can you can get a sense of when these pictures are taken because there's uh, there's uh, what's that word graffiti. Mm. It says get rid of Maggie, please. Uh-huh. Um, and then so you this would have been uh, late seventies, early eighties. Crickieth. Well, seventy nine. She came to power, didn't she? So it would have yeah, been early eighties. Early eighties, yeah, probably. Yeah. Uh, Crickieth yeah. further up. Uh, Trehafford. It, oh, it's beautiful. It's just I'm, I'm just reading out the names because that that kind of uh, rail or rail, as they might say. That's Butlins. I can tell that's Butlins. Um, Castleton. So in essence, it, this, this 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 is a black and white journey through Wales, really from the. It looks like seventies upwards, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, I What's just that? Show, I'm just going to show Neil two pictures: one of Cardiff and yeah. one of Taffili, which is uh, <laughs> uh, near near Cardiff. Uh, oh my word. <laughs> What on earth kind of night out is that? <laughs> what is he wearing? <laughs> Not a lot. No. Uh, brilliant, isn't it? So, um, You've got to be careful. There's the, the bouquet chicken's going to grab that. <laughs> what, I su- what I suggest Double O Gordon does is get hold of this book and then use this as an idea because this is yeah. a, it's such a beautiful book. Land of My Father, photo- photographs by David Hearn. Um, as always with these books, by the way, I'm linking to them on the website. Yes, yes. And if you do happen to click through the link and purchase the book, then we do get a couple of pennies in our tip jar. You do not pay a penny more. Um, although some of the books are out of print and various other things. So there you go. Um, love that book. Sorry, I just went in a, 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 you were, you were, a daydream you of a nostalgia. Yeah. Um, but that's what the books well, are all about, good. right? Uh, Mick, thank you for your uh, your mail. Mick, uh, Mick Photography. Oh, Mick. Oh, God, here we go. So I normally give these to you. Uh, Mick Sp- uh, speak, speak, um, Speakerman. Speak, speakerman. Speakerman. How can you? How could you think that was photography? What do you mean? No, that was his... Mick Photography. Oh no, hang yeah, on, no, Mick. that that's his company. And then I, uh, I read out his full name. He did say, "Good luck pronouncing that." I'd love to hear it. Uh, Normally, I'd have given this Mick to uh, <laughs> to Kev. Anyway. Uh, hey Neil, to the Kev- illiterate fool on the other <laughs> no, side of the not bench. At all, not at all. <laughs> hey Neil, it's just nice to see you wrestling with them. Um, hey Neil and Kev, just want to let you you guys. I really love the show and fell in love with a song, "New Shoes" by Blue Wednesday, which of course is the, mm. the theme song. It is a good song. Mm. Since then, I started collect, uh, collecting a playlist of great music for photo films, videos, and so on and so forth. Do you do you keep playlists for this kind of purposes? Um, well, yeah, the answer is yes. I um, On Artlist, you can hold um, songs in collections. 
and I often keep um, my royalty-free site just playing music when I'm editing and doing stuff in the office that, that doesn't require me to think too much hmm. um, because uh, as, as songs come up randomly, I can add them to different collections like Wedding or, I mean, I've got collections that I haven't used at all. Street photography. I'm not, you know, not the most prolific street photographer, as you know. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I, I do that. Do you do a similar kind of thing? No. No? Okay. All right. <laughs> Short and sweet. That's what I would do, Mick. Mick Speakerman. Speakerman. I'm sure it's Speakerman. Yes. Right, your question. Okay. Uh, Joe Arthur, he says, uh, possible topic for the show. Yeah. When will the full frame equivalent drop from the vernacular <laughs> when describing APS-C lenses? Oh, yeah. Are we still holding on to that last thread of having a full frame and uh, afraid to admit we've fully let go. Are we still trying to explain ourselves to the full frame fellas? Full frame fellas. Well, Sounds like a, a boy band, doesn't, doesn't it? it? Full frame fellas. Welcome on stage, full frame fellas. Beginners often seem confused by the comparison, so it doesn't even seem helpful to them. Yeah, it's a really valid point, actually. I'm sick to death of, uh, you know, when you see, you know, 35 mil equivalent is... It's, because actually, to most people who weren't around, you know, and haven't shot with... Uh, full frame for for a long time it's irrelevant but i do i do suppose it's when people will talk about certain focal lengths if you if you have the if, if you had one language for it people would say all oh, right 24 mil i understand that but yeah. of course in fuji language you've got to say, say 16 mil yeah but but also but so what gives full frame the um you know what gives full frame the the the, the rock of god honor kind of thing because it to, was here, a, because it was here first maybe. it really wasn't first was Coca-Cola it there was there the was Pepsi? there was other things before that well when you compare what ex- did we do by when uh, true, medium yeah. format and uh, that Zach, uh, Zach Arias, uh, yeah film yeah i but i that, agree with joe actually yeah. it's um it's yeah it just confuses people mm. totally well i find myself doing that on this show all the time saying 16 uh, or 24 and so yeah I, yeah. I did the very same it's, thing you know I would imagine that m- mm. most people who listen to the show probably don't give a pig's ear about it <laughs> a pig's ear yeah okay. wasting words uh, Paul Hornsby um, please 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 pl- honestly he's done this many please pleases can Fujifilm release a monochrome camera I'm convinced with their sensor expertise and awesome optics that this would easily rival the overinflated Leica monochrome I like the Leica monochrome Mm-hmm. cameras uh, with no color array filter or low pass filter this would truly expand fuji's innovative approach to photography they could even use one of their current camera bodies fitted with a monochrome sensor tweak the software menus and boom please make it uh, with interchangeable lenses your thoughts yeah I, I, well i i know lots of people and i i have actually believe it or not sat in the back of a taxi in tokyo and had conversations about certain things yeah. like that um however i very 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 much i certainly don't know of anything and yeah. i very much doubt as many pleases as paul has got um i'm gonna say <laughs> you're the wrong unlikely one to, you're please, the wrong one to beg unlikely yeah. um and the reason for that is and uh, uh, is that basically the r and d and the costs of something like that are way more than the amount of people that would buy it. Yeah. Because when you think about it, most people who buy camera, like unless you're buying a, a professional system, yeah. uh, like an XT3 or 4 or whatever it is now, uh, you know, most people go into a shop and if they see a camera that's only got black and white, th- you know, yeah. they're going to go, hang on, well, that one's got cutler as well. Mm. I'll have that one, please. So it's uh, from a marketing point of view. I, I, I once through the, um, I said to them, look, you know, 10 year anniversary, limited edition black and white x100 or something yeah. that would be ace yeah um but they didn't do it no do they they never say no to an idea though do no they? no we as shall we, consider as we've learned the japanese we say, shall consider we shall consider uh, yes it's a much nicer way to do it absolutely yes all right more of your questions in a moment's time let's uh, head off to uh, club indulgence and thank you very much for your uh, your reviews that you've been leaving on on apple there's been quite a few of late which has been very very kind yeah of keep them coming it really very helps us it really it helps does us. help what really helps us what really 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 helps us is when you share the podcast across other platforms you know um if if it's i don't know if you've got a, 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 an ability to share it by twitter or or do it through your facebook page or something that really does help us you never know it just takes one other person to say i like that and then they share it and then who knows yes anyway you you can go first with uh, i have one from was and ed right uh, he says incredibly funny but also informative love it that's it is that, is that, okay uh, just great this is from uh, grant catches a light <laughs> the <laughs> okay. no sorry grant catches light 
that would be totally different, wouldn't it? Grant catches a light. Sorry. Love this podcast. This is my Tuesday morning drive to work ritual each week. Neil and Kev are amazing combo. Shows often talk about wedding photography, but hey, they're wedding photographers, so what? Uh, but they also have loads of great guests, um, which cover many different types of shooting. Oh, and Neil has... Uh, I, I know I can't read that, because that's too sort of... That's big-headed, that. Uh, G-Stone76 says, Bloody brilliant! <laughs> <laughs> I've changed from Canon to Fujifilm, and the best part is that it brought me to this podcast. Ah. These two geezers are geezers. funny yet informative and don't have bad smooth jazz playing in the background like... <laughs> Uh, like we do like so many other street <laughs> photography podcasts I've come across uh, well this is club indulgence where jazz is allowed isn't it yeah alright one more jo- Jonathan Ryder thank you um, easily one of my favourite podcasts the Fujicast is consistently informative helpful and interesting but what makes it stand out is its human and down to earth tone in an era where the ego seems to be taking centre stage more and more within photography Kev and Neil managed to keep things refreshingly simple and laid back uh, despite the ov- the obvious talent and experience, well, Kev has all the um, uh, Kev has all the talent. I have a little bit of experience. <laughs> I learn something almost every time I tune in. I come away feeling a bit better about my own endeavours in the photo industry. Well, that's got to be a good thing. And for all those people that have left something, thank you and remember this: you're our favourite listener, and we mean it sincerely, folks. Right, your question. Okay, I have one from Colin Bately. Colin Bately. Yeah. And before, before I read out the comment... You're not sure about this? Uh, no, I, I haven't actually read the question. Well, However, uh, okay. I, always, I usually go to the PS first, because oh, PS to me is very exciting. Oh, right. Postscript. That means, Are you the sort of person that reads the end of a book before you've oh, got no. to the end of it? Never, never, never. I edit my weddings backwards, but I never read a book backwards. See, I see, I do. I've, I go Often I go to the end of a book. <laughs> I like to know the way it's going to play out, and then I can, and then I can uh, see if I want to invest my time reading it. So weird. <laughs> anyway, P.S. Kev, does your aunt get the bus? Mm? As I may have had her as a passenger. <laughs> right. Okay. That's the weirdest P.S. ever. Well, and the answer is, Colin, um, depends on where you live. Yeah. Um, I have an auntie in Poole. Um, I have an auntie in Newport. Oh, actually, no, I don't. She died just before Christmas. Oh, um, sorry about that. I have um, no other aunties, I don't think. Oh. Oh, no, I need to be careful because if my aunties are listening... How many yeah. aunties have got? I've Try and remember the aunties that you have got. I got Auntie and in, 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 uh, Paul. Yeah. Uh, auntie Barbara's just passed away. Um, oh, I got Auntie Audrey, who's my mum's sister. Auntie Audrey, right? Uh, auntie, not Auntie Audrey. That's my mum's. That's my mum's mum's sister. She's also passed away. I've got Auntie Marie. Auntie Marie. Auntie Marie. Are you making these aunties up now? No. Auntie Are these Marie. real aunties or the t- type of aunties that, that mum and dad used no, to no, no, say? No. That, you know. real, real aunties with a caveat. So Auntie Marie right. is my mum's uh, sis- stepsister. Right. Uh, kind of. Yeah. And then Auntie... Um, Nancy down in Poole. Oh, you talked about Auntie, uh, uh, Auntie, Nancy Auntie Nancy is yeah. my f- my dad's uh, the wife of my dad's. As fascinating as this is to go through your your entire <laughs> genealogy, <laughs> uh, I even threw myself into, an, uh, into a, a deep coma. Then, oh my god, Colin, hang on a minute. Oh, there's a phone message. Uh, Oh, it's Auntie Nancy. She says, move on. <laughs> uh, I was mostly thinking about my mum sat there listening to this. I know you were. With, 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 like, crossing her arms in anger, thinking, right. you've forgotten. Yeah. Blah, 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 blah. Uh, Does mum listen? Yeah, my mum listens Does all the she? time. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Yes, bless her. Oh, right. Um, uh, salute to uh, Mrs Mullins. Very la di da So, Colin, actually, it could have been my mum on the bus. You might have been thinking of instead of my yeah. auntie. Depends where it is. Colin, you've got a lesson. Oh, <laughs> It was my nan- it was my auntie Nancy because above the PS, <laughs> yeah. remember I said I read the PS first. Yeah. I shouldn't have because it says many thanks, Colin from Poole. Oh, there we go. <laughs> so it's my auntie Nancy. Auntie Nancy, yes. Yeah. Right, anyway, was uh, there a question I love attached to this PS? Yeah, right. Uh, it says hi, Kevin and Noel. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Great podcast, etc. I hate folk doing that on purpose. I, I hate Facebook. To test yeah. it from the very bottom of my heart. Yeah. That's why I left the platform a couple of years ago. Ooh. I have thought about rejoining just to get on the Futurecast group, but I have managed to keep my principles intact. Imagine my delight when you mentioned that there is in fact a Flickr group dedicated to Futurecast. Mm. Yes. Great, I thought. Off I go to join. Now imagine my disappointment to find that you have to be invited from the Devil's Message book oh, no. group. Do I really have to sell my soul to Mr. Zuckerberg just to join the group? The world does not revolve around mm. Satan's guest list. Well, you do have a very, very... Yeah, uh, 
I'm going to tell my nan- my auntie Nancy not to get on his bus. I think. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> drive um, on by. <laughs> yeah, drive on by. So, Colin, quite right. We do have a Flickr group, um, and we will. I'm not very active we're, in there. We're, we're, no, I'm not very. I don't, no. I don't. I don't go on there at all. I don't have Flickr, but we will. Uh, the kind folks that run that. Yeah. Uh, it's not really. I won't say it's on our behalf. It kind of sprung out. It's not like an yeah. official Flickr group. No, no, no. It's no. it's kind of sprung out of the the Facebook group. So yeah. it's not. Which is great. Neither Neil or I yeah. um, are kind of uh, own it as such. Mm. However, what we will do is get in touch with the people that manage it and uh, say, hey, <laughs> can you let uh, Colin, the uh, the Satan-hating bus driver from Pool in, please? <laughs> you had a bit of a holiday from, from Facebook recently, didn't you? Yeah. Although I bullied you back on mm. um, because I got fed up with people saying, where's Kev? Why is he greyed out? What's going on with the podcast? Has it finished? That's just my hair. <laughs> Um, yeah, no, no, I did. I, but isn't uh, it funny? If you step away for a couple of seconds, think, give me some peace. And then suddenly, you know, everybody wants a piece of you again. Yeah, I, I do it occasionally, though. I just deactivate. Yeah. And I just disappear silently and slowly. Uh, it's but not the trouble very is, easy it's, to do it's that, getting though. harder to, I mean, it must be hard to deactivate anyway because of all the people that follow you through Fuji as, as you as an mm. ambassador for the brand. Yeah. And then you've got the podcast here. And- I have to admit, though, apart from our little Facebook group, uh, the Fujicast group, which is a very pleasant place to be, yeah. if I could just delete it all completely... You would. ...and and just keep Facebook, uh, Fujicast Facebook group, I would mm. quite happily. Um, it's... Uh, I don't really like less it less on the platform, the, I have yeah, to say. Yeah. Um, you know, anyway, there we go. Frankie Bruce, direct message from him. Um, hi, Kev. Hi, Neil. Love the show. Have followed since episode nine. I'm interested to know if you could choose if you could choose another genre of photography to work in. What would that be? Something like landscapes and food and sport and keep up the good work. Much love from Maplewell. So Bruce in Maplewell in Yorkshire. Um, do you know? Funny enough, you mentioned food. I've always wanted to be a food photographer. I'd love that. I'd be very fat. <laughs> Fatter. Yeah. No, you're not allowed. Well, you can't eat all of it because a lot of it, of course, is. Um, Swimming in stuff that is inedible. So no, you're not allowed anymore. Are you not allowed to Legally, do that? they changed the laws, didn't they? You, what, what you've, if you're using pictures for marketing, uh, food. Oh, <laughs> somebody right. just started. Yeah, I heard that. that. Um, for food. Do you fancy a? <laughs> <laughs> oh no, sorry. No. <laughs> um, I, I, um, you, it has to be the thing that you're selling. Oh, so you can't can't glaze it with anything. I mean, so, you can glaze it with stuff that people, you know, it has to be something that they would eat. So engine oil was used a lot, for example, yeah, I can't um, for for maple syrup, yeah, I can't because do that. it had the same look, but it would sort of ooze against more. the law now. Yeah, I have against no idea it was against the law. And quite right too. Yeah, yeah. but you can still um, spray uh, glycerin on things like tomatoes, oh, presumably, yeah, yeah, water and stuff like that. Yeah, but you can't, uh, you know, you can't. You can't manuf- You can't make a, a tomato in a in a you know in a factory no. that's the most beautiful looking tomato, and then take a picture of it and say this is the tomatoes you're going to get because oh, okay. it weren't a tomato. I choose food. I still choose food. I like. I like. I, I really like that. There's um, there's a guy on uh, Instagram that I follow. Um, the um, Dennis the Penis. Den- De- Dennis the Penis. No, it's not him. That was a different Dennis the Prescott. Oh yeah. Dennis the Penis. I was said a, that last time. Was, I'm a, sure was a comedian from the last decade, or maybe the decade before. Who uh, got in an awful lot of trouble quite often? Is he? You can look Dennis him up. Dennis the Penis. Dennis the Penis. Yeah. Didn't he have a dog called Ganesha? Uh, no, you're thinking about Dennis the Menace. Menace. Yeah. <laughs> I'd like you to do just. You want, do you want one of my Werther's originals? <laughs> <laughs> Whatever you want today, I'll have a, I'll have I'll have three. Uh, oh, okay. So um, yeah, Dennis the Prescott. Brilliant. Love his work on Instagram. Look it up. It makes you want to be a food photographer. I'd like to be a um, uh, an official um, photographer for either a band or mm. a sport or like a national, like the national rugby team of Wales. They have um, yeah. Hugh, the Hugh, uh, it's called the Hugh Evans Photo Association. I think it's Hugh Evans. Um, they did a great book. Uh, when Wales won the Grand Slam in 2005, it was all behind the scenes. Ah, so they photographed. That kind of access would be amazing. Oh, it was it? incredible. It was all yeah. like in the changing rooms and yeah, on yeah. the team bus, the meetings and everything. I gave that book to um, somebody. So you gave it away? Yeah, but oh. there was a reason I gave it away. Uh, I'm trying to think while my tummy rumbles. Um, oh, I gave it to Pete Reed. All right. Yes. Oh, right. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, anyway, so, uh, it, which is fine. Keith it, Bernstein spent, spent time with, um, uh, with Nelson Mandela, of course. Yes. Right, all behind the scenes. And yeah, that, right. that kind of stuff. Interesting yes. journey that would have been. I'd love it. I know, yeah, I mean, uh, like, I, my, my dream, you know, it's a dream job would be like a photojournalist. Yeah. 
but I don't think that really exists anymore, does it? Sadly, not not in the the you know the kind of well, ways le- that, less of them. Yeah, sure. not in the ways that we we kind of imagine it. Yeah. Uh, and also, I don't you know as as brave as those people are, I I don't think I would emotionally cope with going to the Gabon and seeing you know starving children and things like that. Oh God, yeah, that's a whole new ball game. Altogether. Kudos to those that can, yes. of course. <laughs> Uh, and that's it thank you um, uh, thank you to this week's uh, uh, guest I hope you enjoyed uh, listening to, to Mick Yates if you've liked uh, this or any of the week's shows uh, and if you can and you feel it's relevant please leave a review on Apple Podcasts it makes a huge difference and we do 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 read every single one if you can share the episode on Twitter or Facebook you'll be an absolute star uh, let us know where you're sharing it as well because um, it'd be nice to give those platforms a shout out too as, as the youth say see you on the Facebook group which we mentioned just a moment ago our moderator Stephen Peter are in there um, looking after stuff as well send your questions your thoughts and your oh we didn't do a disaster story this week oh that's oh, the, dis- the disaster that's the, the disaster outtakes. in itself put some outtakes on I knew there was a I knew there was something oh never mind we'll have to do it next week um, and disaster stories send them to click at fujicast.co.uk music is from Blue Wednesday we're supporting music from the incredible art and uh, if you'd like to see our, our offerings we have one page where you can go and do exactly that. Kevin and Neil have their own websites, but I thought it would be easier to give you one website address with all the links you could possibly ever need. www.fujicast.co.uk forward slash the boys. Oh, I can't believe we missed the uh, the disaster. Sorry. What a disaster, darling. Mm. I have to do it next week. So, uh, well, well, we'll see you next week. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye bye. <laughs> and now the bits that didn't make the show. Um. Okay. So my question. Oh no. Hang on. We're answering a question. We're yeah. not reading one out, are we? What was the question? Uh, oh, no. ISO. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, yeah. ISO. Um. It wasn't my question. It was yours. No. It was your question, but I'm answering it. Oh right. Uh, oh yeah. James Souls <laughs> is at the bottom here. I can't see anything on my screen, by the way. Is that? No, I'm not mirroring it. Do you want me to mirror it? No, no, no. Don't. Not necessarily. But no, let's mirror it. Display arrangement. Oh, it's gone on the wrong one. Sake. This is going really well. <laughs> yeah, we should. Um, um, well, I've drifted. Right, more of your questions. Indulgence. Oh. <laughs> it's easy for you to say. <laughs> Can I say that next time? <laughs> yeah. Indulgence. The Fuji Cast is an independent loading zone production. Email the show with your questions and words of wisdom to click at fujicast.co.uk. Email any complaints and political nonsense to our wives who will deal with your comments in their own good time and in their own good way.